this edition of Manned Space, we take a look at the life of Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter and his flight aboard the Aurora 7. Please watch for upcoming videos at least twice a week, during which I'll discuss the history of the space program by highlighting artifacts and memorabilia from my extensive space collection. A native Coloradoan, Malcolm Scott Carpenter was born in Boulder, Colorado on May 1, 1925. After spending two years living in New York, Carpenter returned to Colorado and attended Boulder High School until his graduation in 1943. Following graduation with World War II raging and with designs on flying aircraft, Carpenter enlisted in the United States Navy. He spent one year in the college V-5 program, also known as the Naval Flight Preparatory School. He logged eight hours flying time before World War II came to an end thus returning Scott back to Boulder. Once home, Scott resumed his education at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where according to his official NASA biography, he received a Bachelor of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering in 1949. He was commissioned in the U.S. Navy that same year. With the outbreak of the Korean War, Scott earned his pilot wings in 1950 following his solo flight at Pace Field near Pensacola. He was soon flying patrol missions from Alaska and Japan. By 1954, he had attended the Navy Test Pilot School at Patuxent River, Maryland. Fast forward to October 1957, when the Soviet Union became the world's first nation to successfully orbit a satellite around the Earth. Dubbed Sputnik 1, Americans were caught off guard by the Soviet first. A month later, the Soviets launched Sputnik 2, this time carrying a space dog into orbit. In response to these developments, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act on July 29, 1958, and on October 1, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was born. The development of manned spaceflight became a priority for NASA and eventually Project Mercury was conceived. The goal of Project Mercury was to place a man in Earth's orbit and return him safely to Earth. When the call went out for volunteers, Carpenter submitted his application. Seven volunteers were selected from among scores of applicants, and when NASA announced the names of the original Mercury 7 astronauts on April 9, 1959, Malcolm Scott Carpenter was among the elite group. Like all the astronauts, Scott underwent intensive training with NASA. Additionally, each of the astronauts was designated a specialist in one of the array of components under development for spaceflight. Scott's specialty was communication and navigation. He would go on to serve as backup pilot for John Glenn's historic Friendship 7 flight, America's first orbital flight on February 20, 1962. Then, on May 24, 1962, Scott Carpenter became only the sixth human to fly into space, flying America's fourth manned flight and only her second orbital flight. He piloted his spacecraft named Aurora 7 through three orbits of the Earth at a maximum altitude of 164 miles before splashing down in the Atlantic Ocean. The flight of Aurora 7 is perhaps most infamously remembered for overshooting its designated landing site by over 250 miles. It took recovery ships nearly an hour to locate Carpenter following his splashdown in the Atlantic. Once located, he was ferried by helicopter to the USS Intrepid, where it was determined he was in good health. NASA management, or more specifically, Flight Director Christopher Kraft, believe that the overshoot was directly caused by Carpenter's being distracted by objects floating outside his spacecraft window. Like John Glenn before him, Carpenter was captivated by what were termed fireflies, tiny luminescent objects seen emanating from the spacecraft each time an interior wall was struck. 
It was later determined that what the astronauts had seen were ice crystals that had developed on the side of the spacecraft. Carpenter, it was said, had consumed an inordinate amount of fuel, maneuvering himself for a better view of the fireflies. According to Kraft, Carpenter was distracted by the fireflies long enough to prevent the timely firing of retro rockets that would have slowed him adequately to make a pinpoint landing. According to Carpenter, however, several different reasons existed for the overshoot, including a faulty horizon sensor on the spacecraft and a heavy scientific workload during the mission. Whatever the reason, Aurora 7 would prove to be Scott's one and only space flight. He eventually left the space program in 1964 and joined the Navy's Sea Lab program, during which he gained the distinction of becoming an astronaut argonaut, having spent 30 days living under sea aboard Sea Lab 2. Following his Sea Lab experience, Scott retired from the Navy in 1969. According to NASA, he continued to focus on aerospace in the sea after his retirement. He founded Sear Sciences Inc., a venture capital company aimed at developing ocean resources and improving the environment. He also served on the boards of several corporations. I had the pleasure of meeting Scott for the first time in 2010 during the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation's annual Astronaut Autograph and Memorabilia Show. It turns out Scott was friends with my good friend and next door neighbor. They knew each other for years after initially crossing paths due to their shared interest in scuba diving. Here's a picture my friend shared with me while he was visiting Scott at his home in Vail, Colorado. It turns out Scott was an avid skier. The real reason my friend was with Scott on this day was to have him autograph a beautiful banner depicting the mission patch of his Aurora 7 flight, a banner that's now a treasured addition to my personal space collection. It turns out my friend raises money for the Tailhook Association, an organization dedicated to providing scholarships to the children of fallen naval aviators. The banner was displayed at a fundraising party for the association that my neighbor hosted at his home and which Scott attended. I asked Scott to please sign the banner in exchange for a contribution to the Tailhook Association. He graciously obliged. Here you can see Scott signing the banner. Now let's take a closer look at the banner. Measuring about four feet by four feet, once it was signed I had it framed to be able to display it. Here you can see it in the frame. Note Scott's autograph above the word carpenter. A closer look at the autograph reveals the inscription Scott has included. First is a reference to the mission itself, Aurora 7. All of the Mercury astronauts use the number 7 in their mission patches in recognition of the selection of the 7 original astronauts. The symbol Scott has used in writing the number 7 is the design of the Mercury 7 Astronaut Memorial which was dedicated in 1964. It depicts a circle containing the astronomical symbol for the planet Mercury with the numeral 7 inside of it. Next, he's included the date of the mission, 24 May 1962. He also includes the historical reference to it being the second American Earth orbital flight. Finally, it is signed CDR, or Commander, Scott Carpenter. Over the years, I've had other items signed by Scott. Here's a grouping of objects related to him and his flight. First is an Aurora 7 mission patch. Under that is a vintage Great Scott pinback celebrating his historic flight. Next there is a first day cover postmarked at Kennedy Space Center on August 2nd, 1971. You can see that Scott has signed the cover and included the mission designation. There's also a Topps Bubblegum Company trading card depicting Scott trying on a spacesuit. Back in the day, Topps put out a whole set of space cards similar to baseball cards. There is also a Project Mercury postage stamp which was first available for purchase shortly after John Glenn's historic flight on February 20th, 1962. Finally, there is a great 8x10 photo of Scott 
taken on the day of his flight. He has boldly signed it along the left side. The last public event I attended that included Scott was a 2012 celebration commemorating the 50th anniversary of John Glenn's orbital flight in 1962. Limited to only 35 guests, the intimate evening included John Glenn and Scott regaling family and guests with memories of those early space flights. Included at the event was a birthday cake for Annie Glenn's celebration of her 92nd birthday. The last time I saw Scott Carpenter was at his home in Vail on September 3rd, 2013. We sat outside his home along with his friend Dave and I had a chance to ask him about his experiences at NASA. He told me that despite his life experiences, including his time living below the sea, he never again had an experience that equaled the time he spent in space. He assured me that despite never having flown again, he didn't have an axe to grind with Chris Craft. He also showed me some of the space artifacts he had amassed, which were on display in his home. The objects he showed me included photographs with his Mercury 7 colleagues as well as gifts from support teams and contractors. Back in the day, Life magazine had the exclusive on the seven Mercury astronauts. The astronauts actually had a contract with Life magazine for exclusive access. The astronauts graced the cover of Time magazine dozens of times. When I went to see Scott, I brought with me a Life magazine dated May 18, 1962. On the cover is Scott with his then wife, Reen. We thumbed through the magazine and he remembered Reen and the family they had together. He remembered his friend, Bill Todd, who was pictured on page 35, fixing a car with Scott when the two were just kids. Scott's friend, Dave, who was with us, got excited seeing the picture of the two young friends. While he had actually seen that photo at Bill Todd's house for years, Dave had no idea it was in Life magazine. The afternoon was getting late and I still had to drive over the mountains to get home. As we said goodbye, Scott took the magazine and graciously offered to sign it. You'll note Scott's autograph affixed on the bottom. It was the last autograph I would get from him. I'll never forget that opportunity to meet Scott at his home. He died on October 10th, 2013. The only one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts to survive longer was John Glenn, who passed away on December 8th, 2016. Thanks for the memories, guys. Please watch for upcoming videos at least twice a week, during which I'll discuss the history of the space program by highlighting artifacts and memorabilia from my extensive space collection amassed over 40 years. Also, I'll be doing book reviews written by luminaries of the early manned space program. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification button for more great content about manned space.